CBS 12 News is proud to bring you the third in our series of special reports on rising anti-Semitism in America. This morning you'll hear a first-hand account of a family transported to the most infamous concentration camp of all and the unforgettable memories of a soldier on Liberation Day who could not believe what he saw as they stepped through the gates of another. Now we want to caution you that the stories and images in this report are disturbing and may not be appropriate for everyone. We were picked up in 1944. I was about 12 years old. That was a change of my life right then and there. Everybody was sort of in the dark about why we were there and uh, the future of where we were going. We discovered it was Auschwitz. It was a shock to us. We were inspected by uh, Dr. Mengele, he decided where we should go. My two sisters, who were selected to go to one place, they ended up going to a different barracks. They, they, they were escorted by, by, by soldiers where to go. My father and I to another platform where the able-bodied people were able to work, and women and children to another platform. My mom and my younger brother, they were escorted to a different place. And uh, I never saw him again, ever. Did she say anything to you when you were separated? Uh, my mother didn't have much to say because we, she, they told me they were going to a place where they, where they were, had to take a shower. Later on, a, another uh, prisoner who was there for years already, he was from Poland. He pointed out to us, you see those chimneys over there? I said, yes, we see the chimney. That's why your brother and your mother are there right now, being guest and taken to the crematorium. My name is Alden Moskin. When we entered that, that camp, it was the most horrific sight that I've ever seen. There was a pile of skeletal-like bodies on the left, and there was another pile of skeletal-like. And when I say skeletal-like, I mean skeletal-like. Just a bunch of bones with hardly any flesh laying on top of each other. It was so emaciated, I try to, you know, close my eyes and get the picture back a little bit. They were praying or chanting, you know, some prayers and dialects we didn't know, because they didn't know who we were either, I guess, at first. They were half delirious. There was chaos. I remember my captain was trying to get screaming on a walkie-talkie or whatever. He couldn't get through. Get help up here. Get help up here. There's people dying all over this damn place. Get help up here. A lot of crying going on in that place afterwards, I remember, from hard-necked soldiers, because what we saw was, was, was terrible. And then I remember the barracks. You could hardly breathe, it was so bad. And then some of them were lying down on the ground, which was wet and dead. And there were those who were alive, some of them were actually sitting next to or on top of dead bodies, the same on the bunks. Dead bodies all over, some that were alive, and all they were doing was looking at it sort of and pleading, you know, like with that pleading, you know, doing gesture, help, help from me, help from me, help me, help from me, or something. And then I remember coming out and screaming for the medics to get up here. And the medics were overmatched. There were thousands of bodies and thousands of half dead all over the place. Is it Eisenhower, who was the commanding general? He said, I want you to take photos. I want you to get everything down because someday people are going to say we made it up. This is, they won't believe it. Someday people are going to say this didn't happen. It's too crazy. They won't believe us. My surviving has a purpose. 
I want to give what I can, as best I can, to make people understand what Holocaust people have gone through and lost. Because they really have given up their lives, in a way, by going through a horrible time and by losing so much. So much was lost, including two-thirds of the Jewish population of Europe. Entire families, whole towns, six million souls. The mission of the USC Shoah Foundation, our partners in this project, is not just to record history, but to educate people about the horrors of the Holocaust, ensuring these crimes against humanity are never forgotten and never repeated. All right, Laura, thank you. The issue of transgender teens has seemingly become a national obsession. Politicians and activists, doctors and parents battling over everything from participation in school sports to bathroom rules and access to sometimes irreversible medical treatment. But one voice that's been largely missing from this contentious debate is that of the teens themselves until now. Yeah, CBS 12 News I-Team investigator Danielle Dura sat down with two self-described transgender teens to get their perspective on the controversy surrounding their struggles to simply be themselves, Danielle. Well, Matt and Sam, these two teenagers reached out to me, born female, now using their chosen names of Dean and Elliot. They are upset about what is happening in Tallahassee and around the country right now, and they want to be heard. Their parents brought them to our interview. We are only trying to live our lives and to be treated as if, like, we're not less than you. We're humans just like anybody else. Elliot, 16, and Dean, 17, say they're old enough to know who they are on the inside. But under Florida law, they're still too young to undergo medical treatments to make their bodies match who they feel themselves to be. Dean was about to start hormone replacement therapy when the rules changed. I was planning on, as soon as possible, starting my transition because it would help me feel more comfortable in my body. I definitely have experienced a lot of the adverse effects of uh, gender dysphoria in all three aspects, social, physical, and mental. To people who say you're too young to make these decisions, what do you, what do you say to that? Are you too young? I'm the only one who's been inside my body and I'm the only one who knows how I feel. These changes that I can make now to make myself feel more comfortable are important because at the rate that gender dysphoria destroys people's mental health, if we don't start to get support, we might not be around long enough to know when we're older. Elliot didn't have immediate plans to transition, but thinks people under the age of 18 ought to have the option available. I can't speak for anybody else, but me personally, I wouldn't actually get surgery until I was over the age of 18, but I feel like you sh should be able to medic like begin your medical transition and be able to go on puberty blockers. Could you ever foresee a day down the road where you thought, I made a mistake and I'm not transgender after all? Do you think that that's possible to feel that way in the future? Definitely. It can be possible, but also it shouldn't be made a big deal. Like. It would be harder to transition back, maybe, but even if you transition back, there still shouldn't be anything wrong with it because that's the decision that you made. You were like trying to find yourself and try to find what you're comfortable with, and there should be nothing wrong with that. Both tell me they knew from a very young age they were different long before they ever heard the word transgender. Around 11, like okay. 12 is when I realized I wasn't. I will, I kind of like always knew, but like I didn't know what the term was until sixth grade. Can you describe to me what the feeling that you always had was? I never felt like a woman. I still don't feel like a woman. I never really felt like anything. I always felt out of place and I always felt like I wasn't welcome anywhere because I wasn't girly or I wasn't a girl. I was considered a tomboy when I was younger. And, and then when I learned what being transgender meant and what it meant for me, it was really important to me because I finally figured out who I was. I didn't have an exact word for it, but playing house, I would always be the dad and I would always want to go to the little boy section of Target. So I think I knew for sure that my gender wasn't like everybody else's as I entered fifth to sixth grade. For people who say this is just a face, this is just a trend right now that you don't really know if you're transgender. 
What is your response to that? They've never been in my body. They've never seen the joy that my mom and dad see when I put on a suit, when I first wore a tie, when I first cut my hair. They don't get to see that happiness, that joy that came when this changed my life. People look at photos of me and say I look happier now, that I'm more free now, that I'm more open. It changed my life. Dean and Elliot met at the Compass LGBTQ Community Center in Lake Worth Beach. They say the acceptance they find there can be hard to come by in everyday life. And both worry this wave of new laws grappling with issues involving transgender kids will only make things more difficult. <laughs> I'm already getting bullied as it is in school. So with this new laws passed, it just gives people who are transphobic or like anybody that wants a transition, it's made much harder now. What kind of message would you say that they're sending trans youth? That I'm a monster and that they're trying to protect children, but only the children that they see fit their perspective. They don't see me as a person. They see me as just something to be afraid of. Because at the end of the day, these bans are against children. We are still children. Imagine how we're feeling being treated like we're monsters. And that's the end of our story. No analysis, no politics, just their feelings, their experiences, and their words. It can be easy to forget when we argue fiercely over what's best for our kids that they hear us. And no matter what your politics, no child should feel like a monster for being themselves.